Mark chapter 10, verse 17. This is how it reads. It says this. It says, as Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not give false testimony. Do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. Somebody go and get my son. Put him in this service right now. (laughs) Teacher, he declared, all these I have kept since I was a boy. And Jesus looked at him and loved him. I love that little verse right there in 21. Jesus looked and he loved. One thing you lack, he said, go, sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. At this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. I want to take a few moments today, and I want to preach to you from this this concept, this thought. If you're titling your notes, hopefully you take notes. Research shows us that 98% of people who take notes automatically go to heaven, okay? (laughs) If you believe that, come back next week. (laughs) Uh, I want to preach to you from this thought, more than pants, more than pants, and um, before we pray, I just realized I keep forgetting this key critical announcement. Oliver, you got to come help us out. I keep forgetting this announcement I'm supposed to announce, and the people on the screens are helping me. This is Oliver. Oliver, he's our production director. Make some noise for Oliver. <clears throat> Ladies, he's single, loves Jesus. It was getting very sacred in church, and then all of a sudden I was like, I looked over at you, I was like, oh, we have an announcement. Can you make that critical announcement that I think is good, because it's only happening today? Let's do it. So if you buy Friend of Sinners today at the Resource Corner, you get $15 off your VU conference registration. I think we have a slide for it. There it is. We planned that. We planned all of this. Yeah, yeah. Just hang out. You want to talk to them? Yeah, I want to, I want to say a couple things. It's honestly. You're can good. I, can I say a couple things? Yeah. Hey, you guys in the back there, you're doing an excellent job. We love you guys so much. And, but, but here's the thing, because you guys never get thanked and nobody ever sees you and you're in the back somewhere hiding away. But we are so grateful for you. And so we just want to take a moment in the service right now and all of us, people are going crazy for you heroes in the back. It's just, it's wild. Punching buttons, hitting screens. Our church would be nothing without you. We love you. God bless you. Over and out, Roger and out. Code three, we got a code four. Code blue, whammy, whammy, niner, six, six, four, three, two. Land the plane. Let's go. All right. All right. Give it up for Oliver. I love you so much. I love you. Sorry. Isn't it amazing how the spirit of God comes and goes so quick at Voo Church? <laughs> I want to preach today from this subject more than pants, and I believe it's going to encourage you. Would you pray with me tonight, today, as we, as we go to God's Word? God, we thank you so much that you brought us here. Thank you for a fun church, Lord. Thank you, God, for a place that we don't have to take ourselves too seriously, Lord, that you already paid the price for us. So today, Lord, we, we, we inhale your grace that we might exhale, Lord, faith every step of this journey. Today, God, speak to your people. Change us from the inside out. We love you. We praise you. And if you believe it, all of God's people said, all of God's people said, come on 1230 service at iTech. Make some noise. This is um, such an interesting season for me in my life. Many of you know the big life change that recently um, took place for Don Shree and I, and, and that is uh, after eight years of believing and hoping that we would have a child, God uh, granted and God gave this wonderful blessing. This Tuesday will be eight weeks that our baby boy, Wyatt Wesley Wilkerson, was born into the world. And it's funny because every day that he grows up, the more and more I realize I know nothing about children. And any man in this place who doesn't have kids in his life, they would silently, they probably won't publicly, but but they don't know about kids either. You just don't know what you don't know. And I was thinking about before I had Wyatt, now that I have Wyatt, like every mile marker, every week's a mile marker, and he's doing something new, and he's looking at me yesterday, he said, Dad, I love you so much. I was like, you're a prodigy. It was amazing. (laughs) But it's funny, because like before you have kids, like there's just stuff you don't, like you don't know, like. If you ever meet a, a woman who's got like a, a baby, like you'll be like, oh, the baby's so cute. How old 
old is your baby? And they're like, 14 months. You're like, what does that mean, 14 months? Like, I don't know what that means, 14 months, such a strange thing to say. Imagine somebody asking me how old I was. I'm like, 369 months, I'm doing good right now. <laughs> like, when do you graduate from saying months and years? Like, there's things I don't know. Like, for instance, my biggest problem with kids is like, if a kid can say my name, I assume that kid can cook, clean, and clothe himself. A couple years ago, uh, we went on a family uh, reunion. There's about 40 of us from my mom's side of the family. We went to Maui. It was an incredible time. And at the time, my wife and I, we, we didn't have any kids. And so I, I was constantly nominated to be babysitter on that vacation. And I loved babysitting all my nieces and nephews. In fact, on my mom's side of the family, I have 14 cousins, all roughly around the same age as me. So many of them have like little kids and so much fun hanging out with them and being with them. And I, I just give them money so they like me. And um, I was, uh, I remember one day in particular, uh, I, I was with the kids, I had like eight or nine of them on, the, on like the playground we're playing. And this woman, she walks by and she's like giving out free popsicles. And she's like, who wants a popsicle? I'm like, I do, you know? And so I got all my nieces and nephews popsicles and we, we made our walk back towards the pool and all the moms were laying out on the recliners and one of the moms goes, hey, Rich, where'd you get those popsicles from? I said, some lady gave them to us. <laughs> the mom goes, Rich, you cannot teach children to take things from strangers. I would literally be the first babysitter to get kidnapped with the kids. Some creepy dude pulls up in an old rickety white van. I lost my kitten. Come on, guys. We got to find this cat for Jesus. Let's go, you know. We all get stolen. <laughs> but the, the, the worst, like, the, the whole, like, trip came to this, like, culminating, like, disastrous moment. Um, I was once again on babysitting duty, but, but slash lifeguarding duty. And um, my, my little nephew, uh, his name's Levi at the time. He's four years of age. And he kept messing with me. Just, ah, you know, rich, ah. And like at that age, you're like, is that, is that a demon? What, what, what is that, you know? And so he's there, ah, foaming at the mouth. And, um, <laughs> and I told him, I'm like, hey, hey, knock it off. He's like, ah, he keeps, he keeps going. I'm like, hey, bro, not cool. Quit messing with me. I'm talking to this four-year-old like he's 30 years of age. Well, he wouldn't stop. He kept going. So finally, I had it. I grabbed him. I threw him in the pool. <laughs> and he began to die quickly right there in that moment. <laughs> I'll, I'll never forget because his mom was just like super chill. She's just sitting on a chair. She looks at me. She goes, Rich, he doesn't even know how to swim. <laughs> Obviously, this is a mother with multiple children. Right, you don't say that if you have one kid. If you got three, like, he'll be fine, you know? <laughs> I, I jump into the water as fast as I can, as fast as I can to rescue this kid. I pull him out of the water. When I pull him out of the water, his face is one of like terror, fear, anger. He's all mixed up. I start to apologize. You ever met somebody who doesn't know how to apologize correctly? Like that's me. I'm like, dude, I'm so sorry. Hey, but you know you were wrong, right? It's making me laugh because ultimately what had happened was is that I had overestimated this, this four-year-old. I think many of us in life, this same thing happens to us in different departments, different categories of life. Maybe someone or something we, we overestimated and it left us in a tragedy. It left us in a failure. It left us with a great disappointment. What ends up happening in life is that we have this self defense mechanism that we put up, that whenever we find ourselves being disappointed or let down, what we do in order to defend ourselves is we choose to lower our standard. I'm not going to let that happen to me again. That was scary when I overestimated that person and they let me down. And time and time again, what happens in the church is many people, they take the failures of this world and they project them upon a perfect God. 
So many of us in this room, what has happened to us is because this world has let us down, we now have begun to live our lives in a small way, not exercising our faith, but putting God into a box and compartmentalizing him to our little perspective and our little paradigm. You see, the tragedy in 2018 is not that people don't think about Jesus. No, the great tragedy in 2018 is that people don't think enough about Jesus. I came in here to remind some people today that you serve a God who is bigger than anything you could ever think or imagine, and it is impossible to overestimate his supremacy, centrality, and sufficiency. He's a great God. Come on, if you believe he's a great, big, awesome, gigantic, massive, awesome, epic God, give him some praise in this place. Come on. He, 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 he's bigger than you're probably giving him credit for. I think this is outlined and illustrated in such a beautiful way in Mark chapter 10. And I want us to walk through it just for a few moments. And I want us to write some things down, maybe on your notepad, or maybe you just, maybe you can write some things on your heart today. Because I think if you can shift your perspective, you can leave here today understanding and knowing Jesus in, in, in a greater way. Mark 10 tells a story about this guy that is often just simply defined, not by his name, but rather his position in life. He's, he's known as the rich young ruler. Uh, he's rich, he's wealthy, he's young, and he's, and he's powerful. And by the world standards, that means he's doing pretty good. He's got money in the bank. He's got youth on his side. He's got life in front of him. He's got power, and he's got authority. Yet even with all the money in the world and all the stuff of this world, it will not quench the questions of your heart. For he goes to bed at night like so many of us in this city of Miami that looks so beautiful on the outside, yet as you get to its core, it's hollow, it's brittle, it's weak, and people are projecting one thing, but on the inside, they're missing something. And he lays his head down on his pillow at night and he goes, why am I, why am I not satisfied? Why am I not fulfilled? Why does it always feel like something is missing? Have you ever been seduced by success? Have you ever begun to believe the lie or the propaganda of this world that there is this place, that there is this position in life that if you reach, then somehow you will find contentment? Let me just tell you, there's a thing on the inside of you and money won't fill it, sex won't fill it, the world won't fill it. Contentment's not found in a place or a position. Contentment's found in a person and that person has a name. His name is Jesus Christ. He's the friend of sinners and only God can fill the God-shaped hole on the inside inside of you. What must I do to inherit eternal life? I'm doing good on earth, but I know this life is coming to an end. And what do I need to do to make sure that my life mattered and my life counted? And so the Bible says in Mark chapter 10 that one day Jesus is, is passing through and this rich young ruler, he comes up to Jesus and he says, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life. He has this question that needs answering. Now, before we jump into the text, it's important that you, you read all the angles of the text because what you will see as you read Mark chapter 10 is you discover this man's approach towards Jesus. Say, Rich, what do you mean? Well, the way you approach someone indicates how you perceive that person. Does this make sense to you? So, like for instance, um, you approach people differently based on how you perceive them. Like you probably approach your boss differently than you, you approach your, your, your fellow coworkers. Let, let's use a better analogy just to help some people for a minute. Um, you, you probably, or you hopefully do, hopefully you approach your spouse, praise God, different than the way that you approach your, 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 your hangout buddies. I, I approach my wife different than I approach my, 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 my workout buddies. I, I perceive them differently. Does this make sense? Are you following this? I perceive my wife in a different way, so therefore I approach my wife in a different way. For instance, like I've been married now for 11 years. A lot of lessons I've learned. Uh, come on, praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, it's, like, it's like three Hollywood marriages in one right there. Praise God. Um, ooh, it's like rude, Rich. I'm just playing. Okay, so anyways, um, my wife, like I've learned a lot of lessons being married, but, but here's one like critical lesson that I've learned being married to Don Shree. It's not just what I say, but it's how I say it. All the ladies in the house say, amen. Amen. I wish my husband was here. 
Like, this is just, you have to learn, this is the lesson. Like, it's not just what I say, it's how I say it. For instance, Don Cherie, she, she loves to take me shopping, which I love, by the way. <laughs> and it's already, like, off to, like, a bizarre thing because we'll go to a department store and Don Cherie wants to buy a pair of jeans. And so she'll go, come on, Rich, let's, let's buy some jeans. And I'm like, okay, let's buy jeans. And so she'll get, like, five pairs of jeans and then she'll lead me back into the dressing room area, which is just even more bizarre. And then she'll always sit me on that weird little stool in the corner then she goes behind a curtain. I just have to sit out there all by myself looking like a predator. <laughs> Moms walk by and grab their daughters. I'm like, I swear I know somebody in there. You know, it's just creepy. <laughs> and this is, this is the scenario. This is what happens. Don Shree will then come out from behind the curtain. She'll be barefoot. Never understood this. <clears throat> and she'll get up on her tippy toes and she'll walk out and she'll, babe, 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 you know, babe, babe. You know, babe, 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 how do they look? How do they look? Now, it's, it's strange, because, like, I've never called my buddies up, and like, hey, bro, Saturday, we going to Nordstrom's, I'm trying some jeans on for you. <laughs> dude, 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 how's your boy look? Like, we just don't do it, you know? <laughs> and so, she comes out, she tries the jeans on, and then I'll, <laughs> I'll look at her. Now, if I like the jeans, my response is, babe, those jeans look good. Why? Because good means good to a man. <laughs> if good was good for God, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth and said, it is good. You would think good is good for girls, but no, good doesn't mean good to girls. Good means average. Good means mediocre. Good means, are you saying I look fat in these jeans? I have learned that if I like the jeans, Don Cherie wants me to lose my ever-loving mind. So if she comes out, babe, 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 you know, babe, 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 how do these jeans look? I have to go, oh, oh my God. There's a God somewhere. My God. And then Don Shree goes, you like them? <laughs> yes, I love them. It's not, it's not just what you say, it's actually how you say it. And so I approach my wife differently because I perceive my wife differently. Now I want you to get this because this is, this is vital today. The way you perceive someone will dictate how you receive from that person. How you perceive them dictates how you receive from them. So in Mark chapter 10, when this rich young ruler who has this question of his heart, this question that's this common cosmic question that all of us deal with, which is why am I on earth? What's the afterlife about? Where am I going after all this? I'm striving. I'm putting all this effort out on earth. Does any of it matter? When he comes and he approaches Jesus, we see a whole lot by how he perceives Jesus just based on his approach. He says, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, before you get me wrong, don't get, don't get me wrong, like, like, like Jesus, yes, he's good, and yes, he's a teacher, but how many of you know he's so much more than just a good teacher? Yeah. See, this man, based on his approach, perceived Jesus to simply be a rabbi. See, rabbis in this day and age were very, very common. They would go around. Rabbis had memorized the Torah. The Torah is the first five books of the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. They had memorized it. Then their whole life was spent interpreting the scriptures. So people would come to them with their questions about life. Then they would take the scriptures, interpret the scriptures, apply them to their everyday life. So this man, he's coming up to Jesus going, yo, Jesus, like I know you a rabbi and I know you can answer some of life's questions and so you're a good teacher. I, I think you're a rabbi. Can you tell Tell me what I have to do to inherit eternal life. And the problem with his approach is that, yes, Jesus is good. And yes, Jesus is a teacher. And yes, Jesus is a rabbi. But friend, he is so much more than that. 
Jesus isn't just some rabbi. He's the son of God. He's the savior of the world. He's God in the flesh. Yet here comes the point of contention for so many people. Because so many people go, yo, I'm down with Jesus. I think he was a good guy. I think he was a teacher. I think he might have been a prophet. But I don't believe him to be God. And everyone is entitled to their own opinion. However, you have to understand when it comes to Jesus, you can't have him both ways. He's either Lord of all or he's not Lord at all. C.S. Lewis, the great Christian apologist, he categorized Jesus this way. He said, Jesus is one of three things. He's either a liar, he's either a lunatic, or he is Lord. Well, I think he's good. Really? But you don't think he's God? No, I think he's good, but I don't think he's God. It can't be. He was lying. Do you know how many people, millions of people have given their life for this message. Nothing about that is good. He was a liar. I don't think he's a liar then you must think he's a lunatic. No, I think he was a teacher. I think his principles were nice. Dude, look, once again, there's no way that this guy who was teaching stuff, who would lead people to their death, there's no way on earth he can be good. That's some crazy talk right there. So maybe, just maybe, you think that when he was preaching and teaching, maybe Jesus never considered the ramifications of his words. Maybe he never considered the consequences of his message. So maybe he was crazy. No, I don't think he's a liar. I don't think he's a lunatic. Well, then you have one option left. Maybe, just maybe, he is who he said he is. Maybe, just maybe, he actually is God. And maybe, just maybe, he came on a rescue mission to save your life. Good good, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Notice the world is fixated on what they must do. What do do I got to do? People come to church this way every week. What do I got to do? Tell me what I need to do to make sure I'm good. And we look at God as if there's a formula to God. What's the three-step plan to God? Friends, there's no formula. There's no three-step. There's a man. His name is Jesus. If there was a formula, you wouldn't need Jesus. Jesus is a one-stop shop. If he's not the answer to everything, he can't be the answer to anything. He's God. So this man, he he sees Jesus and he approaches Jesus and he perceives Jesus to be a good teacher, to be a rabbi. And notice what Jesus says back to him in response. Jesus replies, I love this. He says, why do you call me good? Only God is good. Now, there's many people that are outside of faith that go, here it is. Jesus, he's telling the world that he's not God. Actually, it's the complete opposite. (laughs) He's saying, if you're calling me good, don't you know that only God and God alone is good? So if you think I'm good, you must be thinking I'm God. And if I'm God, address me the right way. Come on, 1230. I feel like preaching a little bit up in this place today. If I'm God, then address me the right way. So watch what Jesus does. Jesus looks at the man, here's a key line. He goes, you know the commandments. You know. You know. You you, you know. I love when people come to me sometimes in the courtyard and uh, they'll want to confess like something. People think if you're a pastor, that means your life's perfect. And so they, one of two things happens on an airplane when I tell someone I'm a pastor. One, they're like, I can't stand this guy. I don't mind that. The second's worse. They start confessing every sin they ever committed. If people will come through as like, oh, and they, they, we behave like we have questions, but come on, you, already, you know what's right. You know what's wrong. Yeah. Jesus doesn't even know the man. He goes, he goes, you know the commandments. And what does he do? He starts going through the list of all the do's and don'ts. Yeah. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not lie. Young Wyatt, do not dishonor your mother and father. <laughs> now watch the response of this man. The man says, oh, Jesus. I've been doing all of these things since I was a young boy. I've been doing this. I'm good, Jesus. Okay, good. You're good. Just checking to see if I'm good. Now we're good. What time again next week should I check in to make sure I'm good again? 
Sunday's 12.30, yeah, I'm going to come back making sure I'm good one more time. I've been, I've, whoo, whoo, okay. I was worried for a minute. I'm good. You're good, I'm good, we're all good. Been doing this since I was a kid. I've been keeping those commandments, never broke one of those commandments. I'm good, you're good, we're all good, we good. Now, here's what the scripture says. The scripture says that the law, what's the law? The law is, is really the Old Testament. It's, it's the beginning of this entire book. The law, the Bible says, is like a mirror. Okay, and so how does a mirror work? A mirror, you look into a mirror, and what does the mirror do? The mirror reflects and shows you the truth. You can't escape the mirror. The law, God's word, is, is the nature, the character of who God is, that we serve a perfect God. Let me use another metaphor, because this one might be more helpful in Miami. The law is like a scale. You ever try to cheat your scale? One foot, hey, you know. Let me weigh myself in the morning, you know, like whatever. Doesn't matter, right? Like, like the scale tells you the truth. It always tells you the truth. And ultimately, whenever you look into the mirror called the law, what happens is, is you compare yourself to God's law. And what you discover is you see every blemish. You see every one of your wrinkles. Oh my goodness, my hair is receding. Because us compared to a perfect God, we will always, always show every imperfection, every issue, every challenge. The law never quits making demands. I'm good. I've been doing that since I was a young boy. Really? Did I mention there's one more thing you could do? What? Yeah, there's more. What do you mean? Well, yeah, if you're trying to like complete the law, let me, let me tell you there's more to do. But I thought you just, I thought you just gave me the, the list. Right, there's more to the list. Okay, well, once I do that, will I be good? No, there'll be more to the list. Okay, but when does the list end? Oh, it doesn't ever end. So you think you're good? Yeah, I've been doing it since I was 12. No, there's more to do. I want you to go and I want you to sell all your houses. I want you to empty your bank accounts. I want you to sell everything you have and give it all to the poor. Then come follow me. <laughs> and the Bible says that this man, because he had great wealth, hung his head and walked away. There's always more to do when you view life through the law. See, here's the challenge with us. Sin doesn't make you bad. <laughs> Sin makes you dead. Imagine you were drowning and you didn't know how to swim. Help, help, and I threw you a swimmer's manual. You'd be like, oh, you're done. <laughs> if you're drowning and you don't know how to swim, you don't need a swimmer's manual. You need a savior. You need somebody to rescue you. You need somebody to do for you what you can't do for yourself. I remember I was getting certified to be a scuba diver and I was doing this, this my last beach dive. It was a group of about 15. We're going off the beach and we're going out there into the water. And as we're getting into the water, we're about 25 to 50 yards away. There's this man and he's drowning and nobody sees him. My instructor, it was incredible. He made this beeline right to the guy. He gets over to the guy and starts to rescue the man. But I'll never forget what I witnessed and what I saw. Because this man, as he was being rescued, he's, he's putting his hands everywhere and he, He's panicking and he's fighting back and literally both of them start going under the water. And I could hear the instructor say, quit fighting, let me swim for you. And to me, it's a picture of what so many people in 2018 look like. Because we come to church and we still think that Jesus is a supplement to our life. Friend, he's not a supplement to your life. He's the savior of your life. And the only way you're going to be rescued is when you receive his help. When you receive his grace. When you understand you can't swim, he's got to swim for you. Come on, somebody. Give God a shout of praise in this place. You can't do it. Oh, Jesus, I've been keeping those commands since I was a young boy. 
classic religious response. Because religion will always make you proud of yourself, while the gospel will always make you proud of Jesus. See, this is just fundamental, this is just basic. You can't go to Jesus until you quit going to yourself. I want us to be a church that when we leave here, you don't leave here going, I'm good. I want you to leave here going, I'm good because of his grace. He forgave me again, he loved me again, he extended mercy again, he accepted me, here I am again. Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Only God is good. That's who I am. I'm God. You should address me the right way. You know the commandments. Don't do this. Don't do that. Don't do this. Don't do that. Well, I've been doing that since I was a young boy. I'm good. No, there's more to do. It's funny because I grew up in church and this passage would be preached at youth camp. And the invitation would be made. Who's ready to sell everything and follow Jesus? And I would run to the altar. I'd weep. I'd walk out of there. I wouldn't sell nothing. <laughs> because what if there's more to the story? There's no doubt. You've got to read on. Of course, Jesus is talking about greed. Jesus will challenge greed. Absolutely. Like, the world that we live in, America 2018, listen, you don't have to be rich to be greedy. Some of the poorest people I know are greedy. Yeah. This is actually not a message about stuff. <laughs> Nothing wrong with having stuff. What's wrong is when stuff has you. Yeah. There, there, there's no doubt that Jesus is teaching about greed. He's, he's gonna talk about greed. But I think there's a deeper message going on See, this man, he approached Jesus, and the way that he approached Jesus dictates and indicates how he perceived Jesus. He saw Jesus as a supplement. He saw Jesus as good advice. He saw Jesus as three principles to live by. He saw Jesus as a rabbi. And because he perceived him as a rabbi, he received the rabbi answer. The rabbi answer would have been, you got to do more because the law never stops making demands. The law is full of demand, but grace is full of supply. I believe that if this man approached Jesus properly, I believe like every other encounter in the New Testament, Jesus would have been full of, he would have been rich in mercy. He would have extended grace. I believe this man came with a religious heart saying, what do I need to do? What can I do? I need to do this. You're a teacher. Speak to me. Give me some good advice. So Jesus said, cool. If that's how you see me, here's some good advice. Quit doing this. Do more of that. That will make you more morally decent. That will make you more awesome in society. That will help your perception. Here's some more good stuff to do. But had this man come and fallen on his knees and said, you are the son of God. I need to be rescued. I need to be saved. Only you and you alone can give me eternal life. I believe Jesus Christ would have given him mercy right on the spot. Right on the spot. You do understand if the man would have sold everything and followed Jesus, he still would have had to do more. Because God is perfect and we are imperfect. Oh, I want our church to get this. The law is not bad. The law is good, but the law was designed to point you to Jesus. That's why the Bible says in verse 21 that Jesus looked at the man and loved the man. See, if you read that verse out of context, it seems bizarre. How could he love this man and then give him such a harsh answer? He gave him the harsh answer because the law is meant to be a burden on your back. And the whole point of this message is whatever's going to drive you to your knees and ask for mercy, if that's the law, so be it. Or you can make a decision and a choice to recognize who it is is in the room. And you can fall to your knees and say, I am no match for the law. I need you to save me. 
The law is designed to drive you to your knees that you would cry out and say, I can't do it. If you're here today and the pressure of this world and the pressure of religion is overwhelming, I want to encourage you, there's good news. Because Jesus, he didn't come to abolish the law. He came to fulfill it. He did it for you. You see, this man in Mark chapter 10, yes, he is guilty of greed. But he's guilty of a greater crime. And the greater crime of greed is that he simply underestimated who Jesus was. I don't know what happened to him in life. Maybe he had overestimated some stuff. Maybe it was a project. Maybe it was a person. But that thing disappointed him. He said, all right, now I'm in control. Let me just lower my standards so I can make sure that my heart doesn't get hurt. And maybe you're here today, and maybe today you too, you have just underestimated Jesus. It's a thing I do on Sunday. Jesus, you can have an hour and 20 minutes of my life, but then I've got to get back to real business. You're underestimating him. You're, you're reducing his message. You're putting him into a box. He's not a supplement. He's a savior. <laughs> when I was a little kid, my mom used to tell me this story about this missionary. His name was Charles Greenway. And in the 1950s, he took his family and moved them to a remote part of the Congo in Africa. And his mission was to spread the gospel. You can imagine the space that he was in, it being a remote area, a village. Most of the people would wake up every day living in huts and doing life completely naked, not having clothes. On one occasion, they were having a church service and Charles Greenway had some friends from America in town and they went to the church service. And during the church service, the friends from America, they, they looked at the men that were in the worship service and they began to be appalled as they watched men worship God completely naked in the sanctuary. When the service ended, they, they grabbed Mr. Greenway and they said, sir, how is it that you can let the men worship without any pants on? And Mr. Greenway, he responded, because I don't want the message of Jesus to be reduced down to a pair of pants. Last time I checked, he's more than pants. <laughs> he's more than pants. And friend, today, I don't know what you walked in here with. But I'm telling you, if this God is real, he deserves so much more than a morally decent life. You see, calculation and crucifixion will never agree. You don't give Jesus a percentage of your life. Jesus says you got to fall on your knees and you got to recognize that I am God. And in recognizing that I am God, I will extend grace, I will extend mercy, I will lift the law off your back, and I will swim for you. I want us to be a church. I want us to be a church that we live continually, attempting, trying, striving, if you will, to overestimate who Jesus is. I'm telling you what, it's impossible. I refuse, I refuse, I refuse to play church. I refuse, I refuse to simply build a program in Miami. If you want a program, there's some other places that got better programs. I'm not giving my life for a program. I'm not giving my life for a Sunday gathering. I'm giving my life because I was dead in my sin. And a Savior named Jesus Christ, the friend of sinners, he came and he bought me back. He took the burden off my back and he paid the price. And today I'm forgiven. I'm a child of God and he has the most powerful.
powerful name. Come on, church. Sing it out. Come on.